Bandule ste orle si zi Dobre to bi brate Maješ krila, maješ silu Je koli litati Teper letiš v Ukrajinu Tebe vyhľadajúť Poletil by ja s tobou Alexei Kirikesha with Fata Morgana and Bandurist Orlesezi, Bandurist Blue Eagle. And that is a very popular poem of Taras Shevchenko, Ukraine's national bard, and a song about his thoughts and longings for Ukraine while he was in exile in Russia. Alexei Kirikesha with 
Bandureste Orle Sezi. Dobri večer, šenovni radi suhači, ta vitaju vas vsih na radio predaču Naš Holos Radio Krinskoho Korinja, kotra podjeci vam jak svečajno ščo subote o šosti hodeni na bahatomovni radio stanci AM 1320 CHMB v misti Vankoveri. I pomareži PCJ Radio Mižnorodnemu. Pri mikrofoni Pavlina Makori, djakuju ščo rišala per bute zimnoju na stupnu hodenu. Hello there and welcome to Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio here on AM 1320 CHMB Vancouver and in international syndication on PCJ Radio International. I'm Paula demchuk Macquarie, Pukarinskia Pavlina, and I'm delighted to have you with me. We've got a great program lined up for you. We've got uh, episode four of Joan Brander's Piss and Cup podcast, and she'll be talking all about symbols. So she'll be unlocking more of the mysteries of this ancient art for you. On Ukrainian Jewish Heritage, an interview with Bob Onischuk, who is chair of the National Holodomor Awareness Tour, and he'll be talking about the newest addition to the mobile classroom library, the film Hunger for Truth, the Rhea Kleiman story. As well, he'll be talking about the Holodomor tour bus, which is starting up its 2019 cross-Canada tour on Vancouver Island. So stay tuned for all of that. We've also got our usual proverb of the week, other items of interest, and great Ukrainian music. And coming up next, more words of Taras Shevchenko, the Ukrainians from Leeds, England, with Uchitisya Bratemoyi, Learn My Brothers. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Thanks to the foresight and generosity of its donors, the Taras Shevchenko Foundation has been investing in the future of the Ukrainian-Canadian community for over 50 years. Since 1963, the Taras Shevchenko Foundation has been funding initiatives that strengthen our Ukrainian-Canadian identity and enhance our Ukrainian-Canadian cultural heritage. These include fine and performing arts and arts groups, museums, cultural centers, education, as well as authors, journalists, and the Ukrainian-Canadian media, including this program. The Foundation strives to become the premier not-for-profit foundation in a Canada which acknowledges the Ukrainian-Canadian community as a fundamental component of Canadian society. Nash Hollis listeners are encouraged to support this vision through continued donations into the future. To apply for grants, make a donation, or for more information, visit ShochenkoFoundation.com. sisters from Winnipeg with the sad story of a young girl and a bitter fate and more words penned by Tadashevchenko. 
as is this next song, Sadok Vishnevi Kolokate, A Blooming Orchard by the House, performed by the Quartet Alleluia. Sadok Vishnevi Kolokate, Kruši nad višnjami u dud, Plugata i s plugami dud. Spivajući idu djevčata, A materi večeraš dud. Simja večerja kolo hati, Večirnja zironjka staje, Dočka večerja i podaje, a ma ti hoće naučati, ta solovejko ne dajem. Poklala ma ti kolo hati, malenki djitočok svojih, sama zasnula koloni. Zatihlo vse, tilki divčata, ta solovejko ne zatih. Hi, I'm Joan Brander, and you're listening to my Pesinka Power podcast. I love Ukrainian egg decorating. I've been doing it for several decades, ever since I was a child. I've amassed so much knowledge and experience over those years, I thought that podcasting would be a great way to share my passion with you. I'll be telling you about their history, legends, and symbols. On the practical side, there's tools and techniques used in making them, hints, tips, and do-it-yourself projects to talk about. Did you know that the fate of the world depends on Pesinka? There's an ancient Ukrainian legend that says, as long as pests and care are being made, evil will not prevail over good in the world. They're one of the greatest traditions of all time, so I hope that my podcast will inspire you. Have you ever looked at a pesinka and wondered what all the symbols and designs mean? Well, you've come to the right place to find out. This is episode four, and I'm going to discuss how symbols are used, the categories of Pesinka symbols, some examples, and what they mean. I'll walk you through them. So what exactly are symbols? Symbols are pictures used to represent a thing or an idea, but not a particular word or phrase for it. They don't represent the object pictured, but rather something or idea that the object pictured is supposed to suggest. Can you wrap your head around that? Think of symbols in other cultures such as Egyptian hieroglyphs, Chinese characters, or even digital emojis. Now, turning to Pesinka symbols, they're used the same way. During Easter, you likely won't see bunny rabbits on a Pesinka, but here are some traditional symbols you will see. There's so many types that they're generally put into various categories. These include geometric patterns, plant motifs, animal symbols, and religious designs. As mentioned in episode 2, Ukrainian Easter eggs have been around for thousands of years, and so has their symbolism. However, over the years, as beliefs have come and gone, symbols and their meanings have changed. What hasn't changed, though, is the way they're put on eggs. It's with beeswax and dyes. I cover the technique of writing pesinka in episode 1, and the dyes we use in episode 3. My favorite symbol for pesinka is the geometric pattern. Let's delve into it. Geometric patterns deal with shape, size, relative position of figures, and the properties of space. Sounds complicated, doesn't it? But it's not. Think of it this way. The egg itself can be divided into squares, triangles, and other shapes. These shapes are then filled with other forms and designs, usually in a repetitive pattern. It's that simple. What was your favorite subject in high school? Mine was geometry, and I think that's the reason I like geometric symbols on Pesinka the most. Let's talk about some Pesinka examples. 
I'm looking at a long list of traditional geometric patterns that could be written on Pesenka. Easy for me to see, and I'll do my best to describe what I'm looking at. I'd also like to help you understand their significance. The simplest of geometric patterns are lines. Imagine them as ribbons or belts going around the egg. All geometric patterns start with a line of some sort, even if it's not as straight as you'd like it to be, and many of the lines have names. I'll give you four examples. A straight line that encircles the egg is called a meander. It has no beginning and no end. It's easy to see why this would symbolize infinity, or the continuous thread of life. A zigzag pattern is a saw. Like the name implies, it looks like the teeth of a saw and represents water or waves. Another type of line is a quirky name called Gypsy Roads. I've made this design and it's quite challenging. It's wider than a simple line. As the name implies, think of it like a road. It's usually just two colors, red and black, to give a continuous path around the egg. Evil is represented by black and is never able to find its way off the road. The message of this pesenka is protection from evil and harm. And let's not forget the wavy lines, even, if I may say with subtle sarcasm, it's made unintentionally. These represent water. So those are the lines, and here are some examples of triangles and tripods. Even the youngest child can recognize a triangle. Remember the shape of ball from Tupperware? It targets ages six months and up who try to fit the shape into the same sized hole in a rolling ball. In Pesinke, triangles signify a trinity. In pagan times, the trinity was air, fire, and water, or the heavens, earth, and air. Did you notice these are threes? In Christian symbolism, it is most often the holy trinity. One particular pattern of multiple triangles is simply called the 48 triangles. This design is a favorite among egg decorators because there are so many variations of this basic design. The entire egg is covered in triangles that join up with each other. A prayer for protection was said for each triangle. I talked about these prayers in episode 2. In this 48 triangles design, the prayer represented some important aspect of life. A couple examples of this are water, earth, and air, or the sun, moon, and stars. As I said, symbols on Pesenke have changed over time. The 48 triangles design is a perfect example of this. A variation has been adapted to write only 40 triangles instead of 48. These 40 triangles represent the 40 days of Lent, 40 martyrs, and 40 birds. All the triangles represent the Holy Trinity. A tripod shape is similar to the triangle. It looks like the ancient swastika. It has arms crossed with each other at right angles. Don't confuse this with the stylized twisted symbol of the German Nazi party. The swastika symbol is thousands of years old. Sometimes its shape has rounded corners. I still have a few more types of symbols to go through. I love the star or rose symbol. It's usually written as an eight-pointed star. To me, it's the most versatile of the geometric patterns. It can be used and developed into so many variations. You could have dozens of eggs decorated with star rosettes, yet all will be so different. That's the beauty of this symbol. Each one signifies good fortune. The sun symbol signifies happiness and prosperity. Pagan explanation makes the sun the center of the universe and the provider of life. You can make this solar symbol as simple or as elaborate as you want. Then there's circles and dots, so easy to write. Individual dots represent stars or tears. Sometimes the circle contains a dot in the middle, which I've heard represents the moment when the earth receives the light of the sun and comes to life. This must mean that spring can't be far off. Are you still with me? I've got a couple more geometric symbols to tell you about. Even in ancient times, the cross was a symbol of life. There are many variations of the cross in Pesinka design. They always symbolize the Christian faith. And lastly, churches also appear as symbols of Christianity. 
The basic outline depicts the beautiful wooden churches of the Carpathian Mountains in Ukraine with their characteristic triangular roofs. That pretty much wraps up geometric patterns for this episode. I'll put some graphic designs of the ones I talked about in the transcript of this episode in case you didn't grasp what they look like from my description. But that's just the tip of the iceberg for symbolism. As the names of these various geometric patterns imply, they're pretty easy to identify. Perhaps now, when you look at Pesinka, you'll see symbols in a different way. Let's turn now to Books and Bits. All episodes of this podcast feature a personal commentary on resources to support the topics on Pesinka covered. In this case, traditional Pesinka symbols. You can also see them on my website, babasbeeswax.com. There's no shortage of books that deal with this. Many of them show diagrams and pictures, including the ones I talked about in this episode. There's two books that I'd especially like to point out here. The first book is Eggs Beautiful, How to Make Ukrainian Easter Eggs. It focuses on legends, customs, and symbols. The authors also take you step-by-step step through the process of making pesenke with color pages of beautiful eggs. The second book is one that I wrote. It's called My First Pesenka, Symbols My Baba Taught Me, and was published by Baba's Beeswax in 2018. I hope that it will engage everyone from toddlers to teachers in the wonder of pesenke. It offers the opportunity to learn about different types of symbols. It contains large format drawings that can be colored by children or mounted in classrooms as teaching aids. You can order both books along with supplies, kits, and other books from my store, Baba's Beeswax. Right beside the listing of the book on the Baba's Beeswax online store is an icon which links you directly to my YouTube channel. There's several playlists there, but the one I want to guide you to is the book preview video clips. You can watch me flip through the pages of these books so you can see the format, the pages, colorful cover, and contents of featured Pesinka designs. After publishing By First Pesinka, Symbols My Baba Taught Me, the producer and hostess of Nash Hollis Radio interviewed me about it. It aired on August 26, 2018. You can hear this interview on her Nash Hollis website, on my YouTube channel, or through the link on my website babasbeeswax.com. Tune in to the next episode of this podcast, when I'll depart from discussing symbolism. We'll talk about a technique that will surely help you create the squares, triangles, and other shapes I talked about here. To keep your patterns consistent and proportional, you'll learn all about using pencil guidelines. Before I go, allow me to tell you about Baba's Beeswax and how you can get in touch with me. We're located in Richmond, British Columbia. Our studio comes alive with workshops and demonstrations. We write books, pamphlets, teaching aids, and videos. We have a library for all the publications we produce and collect. Not only that, we have a gallery of all the pesenke we've made and collected. For shopping on the internet, you can visit our online store at babasbeeswax.com. We've had it since 1997. We're doing our best to keep up with technology, so we're connecting with you on YouTube, Facebook, and other platforms. Now we're podcasting, and we're very excited to be doing that. You too can follow the buzz by giving us your comments or a thumbs up. We're here to help you choose kits and supplies, like the beeswax, kiska, and dyes you'll need. You can get everything you need all year round, not only at Easter. In case you missed anything, you can listen to my podcast again. We've put the audio file on our website, babasbeeswax.com. Or you might like reading along, so we've put the transcript there too. That's it for me, Joan Brander of Baba's Beeswax. Thanks for listening, and have a great day. This is CHMB AM 1320, Vancouver. 
24th annual BC Ukrainian Cultural Festival takes place on Saturday, May 4th in Mission. Enjoy non-stop Ukrainian dance competitions from 9 a.m. till 6.30 p.m., authentic Ukrainian folk music, arts and crafts exhibits and vendors, a children's activity center, and more. And, of course, delicious traditional Ukrainian food. Tickets are just $8, $5, and $1 at the door. That's the 24th annual BC Ukrainian Cultural Festival, Saturday, May 4th at the Heritage Park Secondary School, 33700 Prentice Street in Mission. Зібрав хлопців, та й поїхав по морю гуляти. А наш отаман Амалія, отаман завзяти. Hey! Зібрав хлопців, та й поїхав по морю гуляти. Зібрав хлопців, та й поїхав. And a group from Ukraine called Fort and Hamalia, sorry, of a historical, famous historical Ottoman Cossack leader by the name of Hamalia, written by Taras Shevchenko. And one last nod to Ukraine's National Bard for this commemorative month of March. A tribute to Tarashevchenko. Here is a group called Litava with Odsela do Sela from Village to Village. <laughs>
And now for a look at Ukraine's rich Jewish heritage, then and now, brought to you by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter based in Toronto, Ontario. Hunger for Truth, the Rhea Kleiman story, is a Canadian documentary film released last year. It's part of an initiative to increase awareness about the Holodomor, the man-made famine genocide perpetrated by Stalin in Ukraine in 1932-33. The centerpiece of this awareness project is the Holodomor mobile classroom. This state-of-the-art interactive learning environment travels around Canada, engaging students and the public, and it will be here on the West Coast this coming week. During the famine, Soviet officials denied that Ukrainians were dying of starvation by the millions. The vast majority of the Western media were reluctant to antagonize the USSR and either stayed silent or published what the Soviets approved. A few, however, were brave enough to speak the truth about Ukrainians starving at the hands of the Soviet state. Among them, a Jewish-Canadian journalist whose story has only recently been uncovered. Hunger for Truth, the Rhea Kleiman story, is a film that brings to life this courageous journalist's 22 eyewitness accounts published in the Toronto Evening Telegram in 1933. Bohdan Onischuk is chair of the Holodomor National Awareness Tour. He joins us now to tell us the story behind the story of the film, as well as a bit about the Holodomor National Awareness Tour. So Bohdan, welcome to Nasholis. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for uh, having me. Recently, we spoke with Yaris Balan, who's been doing extensive research on Rhea Kleiman's life and her career in journalism, and he's now working on her biography. Now, he told us that while he and Serge Sipko were compiling reports in the Canadian media about the Holodomor for a book called Starving Ukraine, he came across Rhea Kleiman's work, and then it kind of took on a life of its own, and it ended up as a film as well. Right. About two and a half years ago, the awareness tour had asked ourselves the question of what did Canada know about the Great Famine in the 30s and whether there was anything in any of the newspapers or whether the legislatures or the Parliament of Canada knew anything about it. And at the same time, Yars at the University of Alberta, they were asking themselves uh, the same question. Mm -hmm. And he had started some research. And Yars found this amazing story, one article at the beginning, about this courageous Canadian freelance journalist who uncovered the Lodemar and was the first to write about it. Oh, was she the first? She's the first. She beat Gareth Jones by two months. Oh. Well, she was there in September of 1932, having um, persuaded two U.S. socialites who had a very nice board with them to drive her, or she said, I'll be your tour guide, and uh, we'll go through Ukraine, and we'll go through the Caucasus, and we'll end up in Tbilisi, and it'll be a lot of fun. She knew why she wanted to go, and of course, the rest is in our film. Okay, so if people want to see the film, then they're going to uh, need to get to the uh, Holodomor tour bus. (laughs) <laughs> well, yes, at least that, or you can buy the film online from the Canada-Ukraine Foundation from our Hold of the More National Awareness Tour website, and of course we'll ship it out. Great. Um, wanted to know how the film has been received by the Jewish community. Have you had a- any kind of outreach and, and response? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, Raya Kleiman's uh, cousin was uh, Richard Schiff, a Canadian, a very well-known developer who was the chairman of Brahma Lee uh, Corporation here in Toronto. They developed most of Brahma Lee, which is now in the city of Brampton. Oh. Um, and I was actually their lawyer helping them with their land development. He was a dear, dear friend. So he and his wife kept quite a few items pertaining to Raya. And of course, they corresponded back and forth. But to answer your question more directly, we invited key leaders of the Jewish community for the premiere of the Raya Kleiman story here in Toronto last June Mm -hmm. at the Royal Ontario Museum. We had something like 500 people come. Wow. And amongst them were the leaders of the Jewish community, certainly all of the friends of Dick Schiff, who regretfully passed away uh, a number of years ago, but his wife, his kids, of course, all of his friends, including a number of Jewish Canadian journalists, uh, some of them working for the CBC and some of the newspapers. And it was, was very well received. Well, that's great. And I, I assume that a lot of them didn't really know about Rhea Kleiman either. No, they didn't. Absolutely. And if it weren't for the fact that Yaris tripped over this story yeah. by going month by month, yeah. day by day, 
through our newspapers, the main sort of national newspapers back from the 30s, we wouldn't have found the story because the newspapers, the old editions of the newspapers, aren't digitized. Right. So right. you couldn't just punch in, well, of course, Hello Demar wasn't used at the time, but right. you couldn't punch in the Great Famine right. and find it. And it was just by accident that he found it. It was one story. But the unbelievable part of it is she wrote 50 stories. Wow, 50. 50 articles for the newspaper, for the Toronto Telegram, as well as for the British uh, Evening Standard and a number of American newspapers. 22 of those were on Holodomor, and another 28 were on the Soviet Union and the falsehoods and the lies that, you know, yeah. this, this was the greatest thing in yeah. life bred in the world, and of course it yeah. wasn't. Yeah. So this film is getting a bit of traction then? Yes. We're working on having Netflix buy it. And, uh, wow. Wow. It may be on CBC or it might be on CTV or on PBS. So we're working those angles. Great. But the films received very good reviews. It's a documentary of 52 minutes mm -hmm. with uh, minimal advertisement would take it to a normal one hour on television. Mm -hmm. At the oldest documentary film festival in the United States, it won honorable mention, which is their way of giving a second prize to the top documentary. That was at the Dallas Film Festival. It's called the U.S. Film Festival. But, of course, the fact that we retained Andrew Tkach, who was an Emmy Award winner, and Christian Amanpour's documentary producer to do the film helped and had a lot of accolades as a result. So what is in it? Who's narrating it? What does it consist of? Well, our film actually uses Raya Kleiman's own words to drive the story. So it's right from her article. We didn't uh, edit it. We didn't change it. We didn't just give uh, our version of her articles. It's right from her stories. And in between, it's helped along by Anne Applebaum, who acts as almost uh, a moderator or someone who ties the film together. Oh. She had worked with us when she was doing her book. The Red Famine. The Red Famine, that's right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she gave us an interview, which we've used in one of the other short documentaries that we did for the awareness tour called Stalin's Secret Genocide. So it's done in Raya's own words with Anne Applebaum sort of filling in or giving the background on the famine itself. And then the footage in the film would be very interesting to everybody, but certainly to any historian, because it's all archival footage. We didn't use today's footage to show something meant to be or as it was mm -hmm. in 1932. Andrei Koch worked with Babylon 13 in Kiev and with the um, Dozhenko Studios, and we got archival footage from Ukraine, both in film and in photos, of all the relevant time periods, what Moscow looked like, what Kiev looked like, what the Ukrainian villages looked like, including the empty villages in many cases, oh, wow. which, which um, Araya talks about in her article. And even Tbilisi, Georgia, which is where she finally got picked up by the NKVD, and they grabbed her, put her on a train, took her back to Moscow, and then kicked her out of the Soviet Union. Right. So she was the first journalist to write about it, and the first and only journalist to be thrown out of the Soviet Union for her stories hmm. in uh, November 1932. And thank goodness that most of her other articles did not appear earlier than that, because then they would have kept her. She might have ended up in the gulag. Amazing story. Yep. There's only one other thing I'd mention. Because the Ukrainian government knew that we were doing this documentary, and of course, we subsequently showed it in Kiev and were asked to show it in their parliament for the uh, members of parliament. The Ukrainian uh, security services, the uh, SBU as they're called, mm -hmm. opened up their archives to us mm -hmm. on Holodomor from the old NKVD files that had been left behind in Kiev when the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh huh. You're going to see photos and documents in there that will absolutely make your hair stand on end. These are stories of other individuals who um, were, in most cases, liquidated because of either a photograph they took or something that they wrote about this famine, which never happened, according to the Soviet Union. There are really a lot of interesting aspects to it, but it is a documentary in the classic sense of the documentary, okay. except it's done in a very fast-paced, edgy, journalistic style, because we are targeting this for high school students, for them to get involved, become active in terms of promoting tolerance, civility, diversity, human rights, and to make sure that things like this will never happen again. Mm -hmm. It's all done in um, 
interactive digital format. So it's primarily a series of documentaries and a series of actual lessons where the students have iPads in front of them and their own iPads, and then they actually interact with the facilitator and with the 28-foot screens on the other side. Okay. This is state-of-the-art, digital, interactive, and we've done a whole series of shorter documentaries for the public. There's a 20-minute overview of the Holodomor from beginning to end. Then there's Stalin's Secret Genocide, which is a second documentary. It's 25 minutes. And it's got seven of the world's top historians on Holodomor, including Ann Applebaum, of course, Mugridge, Jones, a number of American historians on Holodomor. So there's about five documentary videos that are available. Okay, this is a great project. It's different. It's quite uh, innovative. How did it come about? Tell us the story of the Holodomor Awareness Tour. It was an idea of a friend of mine who was part of our committee. He professionally designed exhibits all of his life for major mainstream companies in Canada. And because a lot of the blue chip corporates have gone to either market or advertise their product through mobile means, and so they use, in some cases, large tractor trailers, but in other cases, they use buses like the one we bought Mm -hmm. uh, new which are these RVs, these big rock star buses, as they're called, Mm -hmm. where the sides push out. And so you create either a living room and a bedroom space, or in this case, we took all of that out and put a classroom with three rows on one side and a 28-wall screen on the other side. Mm. And we took that to um, some sponsors and donors, and we took that to the federal government back five years ago now. And the previous government to this one agreed to help fund it. And in the province of Ontario, the Ministry of Education was so keen when they saw the bus that they threw in $750,000 of their own budget and made this part of the curriculum. So with those two governments fed in for a million five and Ontario at seven fifty, that looked after about three quarters of the cost of the whole program, including transportation and all the associated cost of it, mm-hmm. including going across Canada. Mm-hmm. So this is about the fourth tour that we're doing in the West, starting with BC and then coming back through Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and then comes back to Ontario and goes out to the East Coast. So that was the first program. It was renewed last year by the current government, the Liberal government, because this is not a political issue. Mm-hmm. This is beyond politics. And by the new Conservative government here in Ontario. And that's allowed us to do two additional lessons for school kids on the bus. And we have them ready and in the can. One of them is the Raya Kleiman story. It's be done in an auditorium where they can see the full film and then they have a discussion about it with a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And then there are two classes and two lessons done in the bus with an interactive method of both teaching and then having students involved in searching materials both on their iPads and then then discussing it in a classroom setting. That's fantastic. That's amazing. And we have one... um, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pat myself on the back. For sure. Not myself, but (laughs) but certainly our team on the back. We won three international awards. Oh, congratulations. uh, All of them in gold. It started with the um, A award given by the international digital design organizations around the world. And a jury of 173 picked us as best in terms of immersive education. And we won gold in Lake Como two years ago. And then at the Apex Awards in Las Vegas, which is the American version of the design awards, and this is a design for the bus and design of the whole interactive, the use of digital, we won gold in our category. And of course, uh, the NFL won gold for their use of digital media in Chicago, where the 2018 Super Bowl was played. Oh, Uh, It was a knockout presentation, and it won in its category. But in terms of education, and public institution uses, we we won gold and we were the top winner. Wow. Congratulations. Good work. So how many students have you reached so far? We reached about 35,000 in the four and a half years. We keep those numbers, uh, tabulate them. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the public, it's about the same at various festivals, libraries, community centers in front of city halls and summer festivals that the bus is at during the summer months. 
So then the tour bus, then I guess every year it goes across Canada? Yes, that's right. Okay, and so this year it's starting out here on the West Coast. Yes, that's right. We start April 1st at the Legislative Buildings in Victoria. We're there from 9 to 5. Tuesday, we've got school bookings in Victoria. Mm -hmm. It'll be at the Ukrainian Cultural Center from 4 to 6.30. On Wednesday, it's going to be at the University of Victoria all day from 9 to 4.30 by the library. And then from there, it goes to the mainland, and it'll be in the Vancouver area doing school for the rest of that week and the next week. So British Columbia is two weeks. Then it goes to Alberta for three weeks, Saskatchewan for five weeks, because that's where the demand was. Oh. We basically take booking, mm -hmm. and we're booked solid every day. And then we end up with Manitoba in uh, June, and then the bus comes back to Toronto. Okay. Now, earlier you said there is another film or another version of this film? Uh, yes, there is. There's a, an hour and a 27 minute version, which tells the Raya Kleiman story, but it also then intersplices the story in Ukraina today using the example of one of the sergeants in the Ukrainian army defending the Donbass area, and who's being still held by the Russians in Moscow, along with a whole series of other Ukrainian soldiers, whereas they were supposed to be returned. Ukraine captured quite a lot of Russian military uh, mercenaries, mm -hmm. uh, returned them all to Russia, the Russians have not responded. And that makes the comparisons between what happened in 1932 when Postashev comes in with 112,000 functionaries to create the uh, Holodomor and to close the borders and then to starve the agricultural community uh, to today when Putin's got more than 112,000, either somewhere between 125 and 195,000 military men under arms sitting in Rostov just across the border from Donetsk. And of course, a lot of them are fighting clandestinely in Donetsk and Luhansk with much the same result. We've got 13,000 of our military men and civilians who've died and around another 70,000 injured in one way or another. Well, it's good that this film is getting a lot of exposure. Tell us again, how can people get your film? Well, first of all, we, we will have the film in DVD format on the bus for anybody who wants to buy it. It's $20 uh, copy. Secondly, you can buy it online if you go to our website, www.holodomortour, one word, H-O-L-O-D-O-M-O-R, tour, T-O-U-R, dot C-A. And on the front page, you'll find a button that uh, takes you to the online store. And you'll be able to find Hunger for Truth, the Raya Kleiman story, and Stalin's Secret Genocide, and the other documentaries that we've done in video format. You can order okay. them online, and we'll deliver them at no cost. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much, both Don, for sharing the story and giving us the story behind the story, and also for letting us know about the good work that you're doing. Keep it up. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to do this. Bob Onishuk, chair of Holodomor National Awareness Tour, with the story behind the story of the film Hunger for Truth, the Rhea Kleiman story. I'm Pavlina, producer and host of Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio. Until next time, Shalom. Ukrainian Jewish Heritage is brought to you by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, based in Toronto, Ontario. To find out more about their work, visit their website and follow them on Facebook and Twitter. Transcripts and audio files of this and earlier broadcasts of Ukrainian Jewish Heritage are available at their website, ukrainianjewishencounter.org, as well as at the Nasholos website, www.nasholos.com. Nash Holos now has a Patreon site, and I hope as a listener you'll consider supporting the show with a donation there. Nash Holos is not funded by government and has no corporate financing, so as little as a dollar a month will make a huge difference. Your money will be put to good use to help cover the myriad costs of keeping a show like this online and on the air. So please check out our Patreon page. There are links everywhere on the Nash Holos website, www.nashholos.com, or just go to patreon.com and search for Nash Holos. Shiro Diakuyu. O
Kuban Kozaks with Oichiguna, story about uh, Playboy. <laughs> You've been listening to Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio, our flagship show in Vancouver, which comes to you Saturdays from 6 to 7 p.m. here on AM 1320 CHMB, on the radio dial, and online at am1320.com as well in international syndication on PCJ Radio International. In between broadcasts, please visit our website for transcripts and audio files, information about the show, and of course, podcast links to stream or download. There's a link to our Patreon site there as well, where you'll find playlists, proverbs, and other extra features for patrons and donors. I do hope you'll engage with me there and join the wonderful patrons already there. And our proverb of the week translates as injustice has a short life. And with that, we've come to the end of our program. So one last tune for you. And uh, this has lots of childhood memories for me. Peter Lamb and Chaban. I'm Paulina. On behalf of all of us here at Nash Holos and AM 1320, thanks for listening and Dobranich!